Hello and welcome to a special belated version of Who Wore It Better, where I review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. Uh, I've been, as you can see, I am not in my usual location. I am out of town for the week. I've been doing a lot of driving up and down multiple states, uh, many hours on the road, and so I've just been kind of like really worn out. Especially on Tuesday night after watching SmackDown, I felt I couldn't, uh, do, I couldn't record Who Wore It Better and be at my best, so I had to actually go one day later after getting some adequate sleep for a change. That didn't really happen the, the way I wanted it to, but here we are and here we go. Seth Rollins opens up Raw. He's still a Universal Champion after Super Showdown. He comes out carrying the chair that they allege is the same one he used to beat up Brock Lesnar in Saudi Arabia. Did he check that on the flight? Did he put it in the overhead compartment? How did he bring that chair with him back to America? Inquiring minds want to know. Anyway, Rollins talks about what he did to Lesnar in Super Showdown. Baron Corbett interrupts and just gets booed to hell. Of all of the heels on this show, I will give them credit that Baron Baron Corbin is a very detestable individual, so every time he put the microphone up to his mouth, people booed the hell out of him. So, desired reaction attained. Uh, basically, he says he's going to have a rematch at Stomping Grounds for the championship, and there will be a special referee he'll be able to pick this time. After that revelation, Sami Zayn shows up. He basically concerned trolls Seth and saying, you know, we'd be all so much better off. You'd be so much better off, Seth, if you weren't the champion. So, I'm with Baron Corbin on this one. And then Kevin Owens comes out, agrees with Zayn, and then Seth basically basically books himself in a match with Kevin Owens for later in the night as part of the main event. He just basically wills this match into existence on his own. And that's pretty much that. So we don't really know who the referee is going to be at Stomping Grounds, but uh, either way, it's nice of them to basically give us a rematch from what we just saw, or what some of a, what some of you might have just seen at Super Showdown. At least for me, it's somewhat relatively fresh because I didn't watch that show. I mean, this match has happened before, but hey, uh, for the Universal title, it's new to me. In a rematch from Super Showdown, down, Lars Sullivan takes on Lucha House Party in an elimination three-on-one match this time. Lars destroys all three of them with relative ease, even busts out a diving head, but it kind of looks like a diving elbow drop the way he's going down with it. So he destroys the Lucha House Partiers in pretty quick fashion. Uh, it's probably the best Lars has looked as of late. Just keep him away from the microphone, and why was he on Raw doing this and not SmackDown where he presumably belongs? One of the overarching threads we get in this show on Monday night is the latest in the 24-7 shenanigans, where our truth is being chased by a bunch of the lower to mid-card wrestlers. A few of them get into an elevator with him, but the referee is not there, so no one can pin him for for the belt. So you've got this ongoing thing where everyone's locked and they're trapped in the elevator because at one point the elevator just stops working. So it's it's our truth it's Heath Slater, it's Carmella, Drake Maverick, EC3, and Cedric Alexander. And, uh, you know, without having to go into each everyone individually, the overall story I thought was pretty hilarious. Just the fact that, you know, their, their engagement with each other. The, the, the back and forth between Drake and EC3 was great, where Drake's like, I can't be in here. I have a wedding in two weeks. And EC3 goes, dude, you have a wedding and I wasn't invited? And Drake goes, dude, you're my best man. I just, that was a great comedy there. Uh, and then, like, at the end, they all kind of form, like, this familial bond. At the end, they're all friends. And then when the elevator is fixed and it opens up and the referee's there, all hell breaks loose once once again. In fact, I think, and like, Truth is able to escape, and Carmella pulls him into the elevator and they get away. But you can also see kind of EC3 kind of like holding some people back. It's like, get out of here, Truth, almost kind of like helping Truth out in the way. It was very entertaining stuff. And like, I think that I, I want to see more of title. I want to see more people besides our truth with the championship. I mean, I think that what they're doing with truth is very entertaining and like the wacky adventures of where he's going to be this time and how he's going to get out of this predicament. But I, I'd love to see some things where somebody else takes it on and does something with it. Um, I don't want to say like, oh, kill this off too quick, but I want to see what they do with it next beyond this point, beyond our truth being the champion forever and a day. Like who's going to be the one to take it on and what obstacles will they have to overcome? We get some split screen promo time between Becky Lynch and Lacey Evans in preparation for their title match at Stomping Grounds. This is a pretty, I guess the word to describe this is pretty inoffensive. Like, nothing new was gained from this. Nothing was learned from this segment. Uh, nothing made me want to shake my head either. So it was just kind of in the middle of the road for me. Uh, the basic gist of what Lacey Evans was saying that, you know, she thinks Becky is afraid of her and afraid of what will happen to her once she inevitably becomes Becky No Belt. And Becky just kind of shrugs it off like she usually does. We then go to the backstage area and see Alexa Bliss in a bit of irony here. It would never have seen this coming. She talks to Nikki Cross and says that Bailey, the SmackDown Women's Champion, is a master manipulator. Could it be possible that she herself is the one manipulating Cross? Yes. 
Ms. TV is up next with special guest Samoa Joe, the new slash resuming, continuing U.S. champion after getting the belt back from Rey Mysterio last week. Uh, Miz calls Joe out for taking a swipe at uh, Rey's family, his son Dominic, and so Joe responds in kind by threatening Miz's family, essentially. Then out comes Braun Strowman, Bobby Lashley, Ricochet, Cesaro. Uh, except for Cesaro, they all get their words in about them wanting to challenge for the U.S. championship. Uh, Cesaro takes the first shot, and we get a big old brawl between all six guys. Uh, the baby faces, Strowman, Ricochet, and Miz stand tall, and I will bet you anything, sure enough, after the commercial break, it's a six-man tag team match, Playa. The faces versus the heels. Uh, the baby faces win after Joe abandons his other two teammates. Uh, Ricochet hits the 630 on Cesaro. He lands right on Cesaro's, like, upper thigh and his wrist on the impact, which looks really painful. Uh, it sounds like he's going to be okay, though, but that really looked scary and painful upon impact there. We start to see the U.S. title picture now begin to take shape in the wake of this title confusion between Joe and Mysterio. Now that Joe's a champion again, we've got a bit more of a framework to deal with as far as like who's going to challenge him with the belt next. After a backstage bit where Sami Zayn beckons Baron Corbin off somewhere off camera for a one-on-one -on -one conversation, we go to champions versus challengers as Becky Lynch and Bailey take on Alexa Bliss and Lacey Evans. Uh, the heels use Nikki Cross to their advantage at one point. Lacey hits the women's right on both Becky and Bailey. She pins Bailey to win. What a huge shock. Bailey loses in her hometown of San Jose once again. Womp womp. That's probably why they brought her to Raw in the first place this week so that could happen. We then go to a backstage bit between Shane McMahon and Sami Zayn where Sami pitches to Shane that he be the outside referee, the guest enforcer, if you will, in that main event tonight versus Seth and Kevin. And then uh, Shane Payment man doing that uh, perfect, you know, trope of the manager coming up with the idea himself. He's the one who pitches the exact same thing back to Sammy, and Sammy's like, great, sounds good. It's time for a Paul Heyman promo. He comes out sans Brock Lesnar this week. He, he runs down what happened at Super Showdown, basically saying that much against my judgment and the common sense, Lesnar decided to wait until Friday to try and cash in, but it backfired. He says Seth is not an honorable champion after what he did to Brock, and he says, no more Mr. Nice Jew, no more Mr. Nice nice beast. He says, now instead of announcing formally when Brock plans on cashing in, it will be a surprise. Uh, which is good. I think uh, the Money in the Bank things, I think it's always more fun in a way when it is a surprise. So it's a good thing that he's, he's going to be taking his time with it or just basically waiting it out, making it so you never really know when he's going to show up. I will say it is disappointing. Uh, I said in the last couple of weeks of Who Wore Better that Lesnar with the briefcase showing up the last few consecutive weeks on Raw has actually been really entertaining because at least he's been there and it shows him like still lurking in the shadows in some way. This is a much less direct way to go about it. Um, so, but it's Brock Lesnar, so what are you going to do? The Iconics show for a match up next. In their pre-match promo, they take a shot at the San Jose Sharks, who lost in the Western uh, Conference Finals of the Stanley Cup playoffs recently. Gets the crowd all riled up and booing the Iconics wholeheartedly here, which just goes to show you, even in 2019, dissing the local sports team still works like a charm when it comes to getting heat. Their opponents are called Lisa Lace and Liam Mia, a couple of uh, local California workers getting a chance to shine. Great to see them get some exposure there. The Iconics do win handily here. It's a pretty big squash match. The commentary completely falls off the rails right from the get-go. But yeah, the Iconics win once again, fighting some local talent. It's time for Shane McMahon to celebrate his big win over Roman Reigns at Super Showdown. Isn't this like the second big like celebratory Shane McMahon thing we've seen on programming in the last like two weeks now it seems? Uh, Shane's out there with Drew McIntyre who looks a, a bit weird when he's not in his full gear. When he's dressed in like regular clothes, it's kind of unnerving. Like we're so used to seeing all the wrestlers in full gear on TV all the time that when they're not in full gear, it's kind of like, oh, it's weird. It's kind of distracting. Anyway, uh, Shane with a great heel promo here saying, you know, Roman Reigns has done all this stuff in WWE in a short time, and I beat him. And so just really putting himself over here. Uh, Drew talks about uh, Roman for their match super at uh, Stomping Grounds. He says, I will physically assault you until you are unrecognizable. Because that's how human beings talk, right? So then uh, they pour champagne into the Best in the World trophy. Shane drinks from it, which is a pretty uh, funny visual. Then he brings out the revival for the next match for the Raw Tag Titles as the Revival and the Usos challenge Hawkins and Ryder, who bafflingly have defended the, uh, the Raw Tag titles less than the Iconics have defended the Women's Tag Team Championship since WrestleMania. Um, that was a whole... And also, one thing I want to say here, uh, I, uh, people brought this up last week, and I'm gonna, I noticed it here as well. What happened to that whole aesthetic change in the third hour they were doing for a couple weeks where you know things went black and they had black and white graphics? Like it was just, like, just how I didn't really notice that it was there in the first place, I didn't really notice it was gone until people brought it up. Like I said, 
it was a very subtle thing, and uh, I just kind of like wasn't really thinking too much about that change. Uh, it was a good enough match. The Revival win after the Dawson steals a pinfall after Jey Uso hits Zack Ryder with the big splash. Really disappointing to see how the Raw tag title scene has been treated over time because the Revival have not won a lot of matches since losing at WrestleMania. What did we gain from a uh, Kurt Hawkins, Zack Ryder tag team championship win at WrestleMania? It was a feel-good moment. The hometown crowd popping for the hometown boys, uh, Zack and Kurt. That was cool, but God, like, what did they do in the two and a half months since winning those belts? Like, really nothing. They got beat by the Viking Raiders, who we also haven't seen since they beat the tag team champions in non-title action. They show up here on TV for the first time in forever, and they promptly lose those belts. So, what did we learn? What did we gain as a fan base, or what did the product gain as Hawkins and Ryder with the tag team champions? It was a good feel-good moment for one thing, and then like after that, this completely became an afterthought. Time for the latest edition of the Firefly Funhouse. It begins with with uh, Ramblin' Rabbit and Mercy the Buzzard fighting each other and, and Ramblin' Rabbit saying, Mercy was gonna try and eat me again. And uh, Bray gives Ramblin' Rabbit the floor and uh, Ramblin' Rabbit basically says he's threatening to expose all the secrets of the fun house. And then uh, Bray turns on Ramblin' Rabbit. He hits them with a big cartoon mallet and it turns out Ramblin' Rabbit's full of strawberry jam. And that was pretty much where the segment ends. It's kind of like a very dark episode. It's kind of like, oh, it's sad. Ramblin' Rabbit's murdered again. I don't think this one can top the muscle man dance from last week. It can't top Vince McMahon devil horns puppet from last week. Uh, but we did get to see some more of the hurt and heel gloves and uh, some more brief glimpses and mentions, references of The Fiend. Main event time as Seth Rollins takes on Kevin Owens in non-title action. Sami Zayn is the outside referee. I love the beginning of the match when Sami's patting down both the wrestlers. He's patting down Seth. He goes, you got a knife on you, Seth? You got a knife, Seth? That was brilliant stuff. Also, I got to give a shout out to Seth for the awesome uh, ring attire he wore. He wore that first at Super Showdown. Wore it again on Monday night. Really cool look for him. Uh, it's an okay enough match. Sami gets involved a little too much trying to help Kevin Owens out. At one point, Seth grabs uh, Sami by the collar of his shirt and Sami Sammy immediately rings the bell, which, you know, makes sense. He put his hands on the referee, but it's one of those things where it's like, oh, it's, you don't really see that happen very often. But Sammy has no room for his bullshit, calls for the bell immediately, and Seth beats up Sammy. Baron Corbin shows up and beats up Seth, but Seth chases him out of the ring with a chair, wops Sammy for about a minute with a chair before we go to black. So kind of a disappointing end and a kind of a non-finish going here, but we seem to be leaning heavily toward the Sammy or Kevin Owens being the referee for the Corbin Rollins match at the pay-per-view. My guess, they're actually going to find some way to have them both be the referee, and this wackiness will ensue. Time for some SmackDown action, and for the second night in a row, we get Miz TV back on SmackDown for the first time in a little bit. But the Miz wants no part of it. He feels he's being forced against his will to host this segment tonight. He says he must follow the script. Ooh, Vince Russo has struck again. So he introduces Drew McIntyre and Shane McMahon, who takes the piss out of in the process. Elias is there as well, and you know Elias has gone more evil than usual because he seems to have permanently upgraded to electric uh, over the last several weeks. So we get this weird visual where Elias is like jamming out in the guitar while Drew and Shane are sitting next to him and Miz is next to them in his own seat. It's just the weirdest, like, in that one moment, I'm like, could you imagine, like, watching wrestling for the first time and that's, like, your first visual? Is this row of guys and one dude's playing guitar or trying to explain to a, or trying to have a lapsed fan or a non-fan look at that image and try and get them to figure out what's going on here? It's very just one of those weird, out of context random things like, this is wrestling! So, uh, Miz is interviewing these guys and Shane says, My my favorite part of this, though, is Shane says some stuff after Elias jams out. Shane says his bit, and Elias jams out as, like, a punctuation, which I thought was hilarious. So they show the post-match interview footage with Roman Reigns for the second night in a row. Yes, we get it. I'm kind of surprised Roman's not even on this show, to be honest, tonight. But they all talk some trash. Miz warns Drew that uh, Shane will betray him. Shane wants a piece of the Miz for another time, but he says, you know what, you gotta beat Elias and Drew McIntyre in order, in order to get to me first. So we get Elias versus The Miz first off. It's a pretty short ordeal. Elias misses the diving elbow drop and Miz hits the skull crushing finale to beat him. We go right into Miz versus Drew McIntyre. Drew beats Miz with the Claymore and that match is over, but Shane feels, you know, he's, you know what, Miz, you've really shown your fighting spirit. I'm gonna give that match right now. So we have that third match right away. Shane puts the triangle choke on Miz. Miz got like, has a moment of uh, shine here to look good on Shane, but Shane pretty much uh, chops him down pretty quickly. Puts him in the triangle choke and Miz, uh, uh, meekly taps out. Let's sprinkle a little more of that dirt on him because I really don't see how Shane as a babyface is going to work 
if he keeps losing to Shane McMahon. And yes, I know Shane is pretty much the biggest heel on the show right now, which baffles me to say that out loud, uh, but that's the way they're presenting him. Shane McMahon in 2019, the biggest heel in all of WWE. He's across all the shows. He has all the cronies. What is happening here? And also, yeah, Miz the baby face is getting, you know, I don't want to say buried, but it's really hard to take him seriously when he keeps losing, especially to Shane McMahon. Backstage, Ember Moon's playing her Nintendo Switch, not bothering anybody, when Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville come up to her and tell her, get out of your fantasy land, which I guarantee you that line was 100% written by Vincent Mann. So uh, they uh, knock the Switch out of her hands with the magazines that Mandy's on, and they walk away. And how does Ember Moon respond to this? She just screams and throws a trash can. I wonder if she'll get her revenge. Hmm, I wonder if they'll follow up on that. Maybe? Hmm? We'll see. Up next, the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, Daniel Bryan and Rowan, want to have a unification match with the Yolo County Tag Team Champions, and my eyes just about popped out of my head when I saw friends of the show, Dave Dutra and AJ Kirsch, uh, guys I've worked with a lot in APW over the years, and Kirsch you've seen before on this channel. I've interviewed him once for Getting Into The Biz. He is also the voice of Buzz in 2K19, and I love the fact that they're each wearing just different versions of Dave's tights. Uh, and then they got the cardboard belt. So cheesy, but I loved it. So uh, before the match begins, though, Heavy Machinery interrupt. Got a pretty bland promo. And then they basically insert themselves into the match with uh, the Yellow County Tag Team Champions, AJ Kirsch and Dave Dutra. It's a big old squash match. They destroy Dutra with a compactor for the win. It's cool to see my colleagues on TV. And that, yeah, that was pretty much like the highlight of the night for me. In the backstage area, R-Truth hides himself and his 7-Eleven championship in a work box, but he is unable to get himself out. It locks upon closing. Carmella can't help him because her match is up next. And then Jinder Mahal walks by, sees the situation here, pretends to be Carmella, and says, you hold on, I'll get a crowbar or something. Then we see later in the night, as he is trying to get the referee ready, turns out the, the work box is being shipped off to L.A., and so he can't get it in time. And meanwhile, Archer is still in there, and he'll be presumably dead or very deprived of oxygen by the time it finally arrives in L.A. The drive from Sacramento, uh, to LA is kind of a long one. So we get that match, Carmella versus Sonya Deville. The match was hard to watch at times. I think even early on, it was getting kind of rough. They had to almost do kind of a reset. Uh, in the end, though, Sonya wins the knee strike after the distraction by Mandy Rose on the outside. So what happened to Ember Moon? She got punked out backstage. They broke her Nintendo Switch on the floor. She freaked out and screamed through a trash can. Do we get any of that in the, out in the ringside area? Did she come out at all to even the odds? Nope. Backstage, Alexa Bliss planting more seeds of manipulation into the fertile mind of Nikki Cross, alleging that Bailey was liking some anti-Nikki tweets over the last couple days, tells her not to hold back. It's time for a New Day promo. Big E is officially back this time. For realsies, no bait and switch like last time he showed up on TV. He makes a joke about the number of comebacks rivaling that of the number of titles Charlotte's won. And then Kofi, with about as subtle as a huge brick to the head, going, it's a booking joke. Bonk. Like, wow, what's in the water in Sacramento? Sacramento tonight between uh, uh, Miz saying he's got to follow the script, bro, and Kofi saying it's a booking joke, bro. You know, I could go on about that. Anyway, uh, Dolph Ziggler shows up and plays a clip from Super Showdown showing Xavier Woods' his very pivotal kick to the mush before Kofi uh, beats him in that title match there. He says that will not be happening at Stomping Grounds as their match is in a steel cage. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn show up next uh, at Dolph's side. Sami critiques the critics as he's wont to do. He says he wants to right the wrongs of injustice. Justice. It's really interesting how Sammy and Kevin right now are kind of dipping their fingers into multiple pots right now between the Universal title match on Raw with Seth and Baron and now the WWE Championship feud with Dolph and Kofi, it would seem. Uh, Dolph calls Kofi a coward and Kofi says he will kick ass and take names because that is the tagline of this next pay-per-view we got to promote and they said I had to do it. It's in my script. I can't help. I got to follow the script, bro. Booking jokes. We get another Aleister Black promo. At the end, he asks for the door to be opened and then he starts yelling, will somebody please? pick a fight with me. He's just desperate for a fight. And I wasn't seeing things last week. As this promo went along, the lighting on one side of his face did get progressively more red. So again, the subtle change is getting more angry, a little more pent up and evil, possibly. Uh, I think I like the very, very subtle thing they're doing with the lighting here. Up next, Bailey versus Nikki Cross in non-title action. Before the match, Bailey's being interviewed about the allegations that Alexa Bliss had against her about liking those anti-Nikki tweets. And Bailey goes, consider the source. But she does not flat out deny or or confirm that she actually was liking those tweets. Hmm. Then uh, Nikki Cross comes out to Alexa Bliss's music. Where have I seen this before? Uh, it's a pretty good match, actually. Bailey wins with the elbow drop. You know what? There's still one week of programming. There's still the go-home week. I really hope... I'm not giving them ideas when I say, 
Please let's not have a repeat of This Is Your Life as we build the show. Backstage, Apollo Crews is being interviewed about what happened in their non-match between he and Andrade uh, last week on SmackDown. And as he's talking, Apollo mentions Andrade, which brings out Zelina Vega, who talks some trash. And then when she leaves, we pan over to see Chad Gable with a fresh new haircut, seemingly writing down notes about Apollo Crews silently as he's standing there. So now Chad Gable's got a haircut. Apparently he's been moved to 205 Live, where I heard he had a great match this week. But man, it's it's like it's such a bummer to see Chad kind of reduced to that where he can only really thrive on this like show that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. You know, I think he seriously could have been a tremendous player on the main roster if they just committed to using him when he was there. Main event time as the New Day take on Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, and Dolph Ziggler in six-man tag team action. As the match is going on, uh, Tom Phillips says that Sami showing up on Raw two weeks in a row as part of the wild card rule has to be an oversight by Shane McMahon. This is the same programming that had Roman Reigns on Raw for four weeks in a row despite officially being a SmackDown guy. But oh, wild card rule. It only, again, it's, it's, the, it's the Roman Reigns rule. That's all it really is. So it is more baffling the fact that he wasn't even on TV on either show this week. It's actually a really strong main event. Some miscommunication in the ring between Ziggler and Zayn. Kofi hits Dolph and Sammy with consecutive uh, Troubles in Paradise to win the match, and uh, that's how the show ends. Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, Raw or SmackDown. This week, you know what? I award them no points, and may God have mercy on their souls. It was really hard for me to pick a decisive winner for this week as to which show was better, because I think um, neither show did anything for me this week. It was just basically two relatively bland shows promoting all of their rematches from the last you know three months of programming uh, for their next pay-per-view. And so I feel a little uninspired going into programming after this week, and no new stage have really been attached. I don't see much story progression outside, like a little wrinkle here and there in the matches, but I wouldn't call it really like storytelling, uh, if I'm being honest with that. Each show had some okay moments, but nothing that would put it over the top for me to pick either of them to win. If anything, I would say maybe AJ Kirsch and Dave Dutra showing up on SmackDown as the Yellow County Tag Team Champions was a big pop for me, just because I know them so well. Uh, but if I had to give them the win for that, then that'd be kind of unfair, because then I'd have to give the nod to whatever show had a popular indie guy as a job job fodder, and that doesn't seem fair if I don't, even if I don't know them. So anyway, yeah, neither show really wins, in my estimation, this week. Let me know what you thought about Raw and SmackDown this week in the comments section below, and be sure to vote which show you thought was better by going to the iCard in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.